Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Youth Mappers, Navigating the Ghanaian Soy Value Chain. This webinar is presented jointly by the Soybean Innovation Lab, a USAID Feed the Future initiative to promote soybean production and utilization in Sub-Saharan Africa, Youth Mappers, an international university consortium on mapping for resilience, and the University of Cape Coast, a public research university located in Cape Coast, Ghana. My name is Courtney Tamini, and I am the Associate Director for the Soybean Innovation Lab. Before we get started, I'd like to give everyone a quick tour of the GoToWebinar software, which you can use to engage with panelists, ask questions, and access webinar resources. On your GoToWebinar control panel, you will see a questions pane. Please type in your questions as they arise during the webinar, and we will address as many questions as possible during the question and answer session at the end of the webinar. Any questions that we don't get to during the webinar, we will answer offline and provide you with a written response. There is also a handouts pane on your GoToWebinar control panel. Open this pane to access the webinar agenda, the webinar presentation slides, and a handout containing helpful links, including the Youth Mapper's final report. Today you will be hearing from an exciting group of panelists. We'll start the webinar with opening remarks from Carrie Stokes the Chief Geographer for USAID. Following Carrie's remarks, you will hear from the Youth Mappers team based at the University of Cape Coast in Ghana, Confidence Kabodo, Ebenezer Botang, Faustina Lina Yaboa, and Daniel Ose will all share their experiences and the findings of their mapping project. Dr. Peter Goldsmith, the Director and Principal Investigator of the Soybean Innovation Lab, will present to the audience on how the Youth Mappers findings impact the soy value chain in Ghana. Finally, Chad Blevins, a USA geographer, and Anna Brennis, a USA data steward, will share examples of the youth mappers' work around the globe. We'll conclude with a question and answer session moderated by Dr. Goldsmith. We'd also like to take a moment to thank our partners at Catholic Relief Services Ghana for their immense support in facilitating the youth mappers' team's field interviews and data collection with soybean processors and other soybean value chain stakeholders in and around the Kumasi area. Before we begin with presentations, we would like to observe a moment of silence to honor two extraordinary individuals who are sadly no longer with us. Professor James Oshun was the patron of the Student Geographical Association at the University of Cape Coast and a faculty advisor for the UCC Youth Mappers team. We will now observe a moment of silence to honor Professor Oshun. Thank you. Francis Deborah was a third year geography student at UCC and a Youth Mappers organizer. We will now observe a moment of silence to honor Francis Deborah. Thank you. I would now like to introduce Carrie Stokes, Chief Geographer and Director for USAID, to give some opening remarks on what is Youth Mappers. Carrie, please go ahead. Hello, good morning, and I guess it would be really good afternoon for most of you on the webinar. I am in Washington, DC, where we have the headquarters of USAID. And I am very happy to have a chance to welcome every one of you who is part of this webinar, but more importantly, part of this incredible movement that we are calling Youth Mappers. You all are all making an incredible difference in the world, even though we're not always in a position to see each other, but because of the technology that exists today for us to make a difference in the lives of people that we cannot necessarily even see, I wanted to just reiterate how important the work is that you all have been doing. 
I'm the director of the USAID Geo Center in Washington, and we are a team of geographers and data analysts who are trying to bring a 21st century capacity to our agency to use geographic information, mapping technology, and data analytics to ensure that we're making the very best decisions about the development need that we are trying to address with your country and about 100 countries total around the world. So one of the ways that my team of geographers in Washington is working is with young people all over the world through this Youth Mappers program. The data and the research that you all conduct is used by my colleagues, some of whom are part of this webinar, but even beyond the work here and the work in your own country, you can make a difference by mapping places that have never been mapped before and by understanding the value chain as you have done in your research with soybean. The capacity and skills you have now may one day be needed to help people in a completely other part of the world by people you might not necessarily get to meet in person, but who can certainly benefit from your skills. So we in Washington in the Geo Center are very proud to build your capacity to support you in your own learning trajectory on this amazing open platform of OpenStreetMap as well as encourage you to continue to question and improve the world you see around you where you live. We cannot wait to see what you will do in the next project that you take on from the learnings you have already gained in the first effort here, at the Soybean Lab, because it's just the beginning and you're part of a bigger network, as you know, beyond your own country, we now have many countries around the world that have been joined the Youth Mappers program. And the kinds of data that is being created will be used and reused multiple times over by many different groups. That's the whole beauty, of course, of creating data that is open. So I want to just encourage you from my perspective in Washington, D.C., let you know that you are appreciated. We are inspired by your work and we learn from your energy and the projects you take on in your own world. I'm a big believer that mapping allows you to be, to have your voice heard, to make a difference in a world where people previously could not necessarily be seen. So I wanna encourage you to continue to question, to try to look around your own communities and see how can you make it better? How can you begin to solve future problems? You've already made a big step forward with what you've done, but you've got a whole team of specialists who are career geographers, mappers, and data analysts back here in Washington, as well as around the world in USAID missions who are supporting you and want you to succeed. So I wanted to just say congratulations for the work you have done so far. You are not alone. You are making a difference with everything you map. So thank you for your work, and I look forward to seeing the great things you will be doing in the future. Thanks so much, Carrie. That was great. Before we hear from the Youth Mappers team, let's do a quick poll to see how the audience here with us today are engaged in youth activities. We will launch the poll and give everyone a few seconds to respond. You should see the poll on your screens now. Please take a few moments to respond to the poll. We'll go ahead and close the poll now and launch the poll results.
So we can see here that we have a wide spread of individuals who are currently working with youth on a regular basis, while others are working with youth on a regular semi basis. Others of you don't currently work with youth at all, while others are not currently working with youth, but definitely want to get started. So thanks everyone for your feedback. We really appreciate it. Let's now hear from the Youth Mappers team. Confidence, Boat, Faustina, and Daniel are students at the University of Cape Coast in Ghana and members of the UCC Youth Mappers chapter. Together, they will introduce the Youth Mappers project and present on the methodology, results, and field challenges of their project. Boat and team, please unmute your microphone and go ahead. Hello. Hello, good evening. This is Lucy Zipper's Mappers, and we are going to have a high confidence. We're getting a little bit of feedback from your microphone. Hello, good evening. This is Lucy Zipper's Mappers, and we are going to have a presentation on the findings we had on the soya bean value chain in Ghana. And I'll pass on to our first speaker, Confidence. Hello, everyone. Um, confidence. Let's like this. Okay, this will be the outline of our presentation today. First, we have introduction, then the methodology. We we'll move on to resource and discussion, then the field challenges as well. Next slide, please. Our study was based on navigating the Ghanaian soybean value chain. It must be noted that soybean is an essential source of protein for both human and animal diet. With the infograph to our right, we can see the nutritional composition of soybean, ranging from protein, carbohydrates, fats, and other nutrients. Soybean is a relatively new crop in Ghana, and this stems from the many myths surrounding the crop, mostly traditional with people believing soybean has an undesirable taste and other group of people believing soybean makes men sterile. We have different groups of people also believing in waste time as it takes time to cook and thereby wasting fuel. The newness of the crop can be seen in the attention the crop has as well as the scale of production as compared to other crops. Now we will take a look at Ghana soy value chain. Next slide please. Okay, we move to Ghana soy value chain and we have 77% of Ghana soy coming from Northern Ghana. And in the map to our right, the green shaded portions, we can see that place to be the source of majority of Ghana soy. We have 90% of Ghana's processes located in the middle belt of the country. And this can be attributed to the fact that we have most consumers, largely poultry farmers, lying in the southern and the middle portion of the country, identified in a map with the brown and yellow colors. Ghana has an annual yield of 59,000 metric tons, which does not satisfy local demands, and therefore relies on imported soil to complement the demand. Next slide, please. We saw the team We had a series of interaction with Dr. Peter Goldsmith, who made us quite informed about soybean cultivation, both locally and globally. And in the document to our right, we can that was one tool we used to make us better equipped for the field. And the team then took to formulating a hypothesis, which we used to draft a interview guide and an observational checklist. Next slide, please. Okay. We formulated two hypotheses, and it was based on both price and location. The first being, what influence do processors have on the price of soil in the market? The second being, what influences the siting of processing facilities in Kumase, which was our study area. Next slide, please. Our study area was Kumase, which lies out of Ghana's middle belt. It is the second most popular city in the country after the country's capital, Accra. 
It bears historical significance being the ancient and current capital of the Ashanti Kingdom. It bears administrative responsibilities being the capital of the Kumasi Metropolitan Assembly. Uh, Kumasi was deemed an ideal study area since it was a hub of most of the key facilities in the soybean value chain, having a great combination of both processors and consumers. The consumers being the poultry, the piggeries, and the fish industry. It also had a great number of feed mixes and processing facilities as well. Next slide, please. Hello, I'm both and I'm presenting on the methodology. As part of the study, our target population were managers of agro-processing facilities, feed mixers, and poultry farmers. We deemed it right to include feed mixers and poultry farmers because they were di mostly direct uh, people who received from these poultry farmers. And so we, these feed mixers, and so we decided to include the feed mixers and poultry farmers as part of the study. Also, that's a sampling procedure used for this study. We relied on purposive and snowballing approach, where with regards to the purposive sampling, we were aided by the Cali Relief Services who had long standing relationship with these agro-processing managers to be able to reach the target population. Also, we used the snowballing approach, which we had to ask the managers if they had an idea of any other processes who were not on our list. And this aided us in reaching out to the target population. Next slide. As part of this project, we deliberated on the medium of collecting the data, and we decided to use Kobo Toolbox because it was open source, it could collect locational information, collect data whilst offline, and sync data either immediately or later after the field exercise. We, we saw it to be more good because we didn't know the exact areas of these processing facilities and we were weren't sure of the network there. That is why we relied on Kobo for the field data collection. So on the right side of our slide is an image of some of the instruments we developed for the field data collection. Next slide, please. As part of the data collection, we developed two main instruments for the field data collection. These are the interview guide and an observational checklist. And in the interview guide, our variables of interest were the price of soya, source, storage capacity, and yearly output. With regards to the observational checklist, we wanted to look at the physical features in and around the facility. Therefore, decided to look at the nature of roads leading to the facility, protective clothing worn, conditions of processing equipment. And to the right side of our slide is an image showing some women working in one of the processing facility. Next slide, please. After collecting the, in the course of collecting the data, um, we had to provide this evidence of we using, indeed using Kobo in the field data collection. And so on the left of our slide is a zoomed in image of we collecting locational information using Kobo. And then to the right is we also using Kobo in collecting data, but this time round zoomed out. Next slide, please. And so after collecting the data, when we came back, we were privileged to have Kobo giving us a summary report of the data we gathered from the field. And this can be inferred from the image on our right, which gave a brief statistics or descriptive statistics of the data we gathered from the field. Again, we were able to visualize the data we gathered on a map because of the locational, locational information we collected. Also, Kobo had a variety of format, data format in which we could download for our analysis, but we downloaded in Excel and SPSS format. Again, the data was also disintegrated for us. Next slide, please. Prior to um, as part of the project and as geographers, locational information and locational analysis is paramount to us. And as part of that, we were privileged to have our deputy director, who is Chad Bevelins, to mount a task on the hot tasking manager for us to obtain some of this spatial information. 
And so some of the entities that we had to map were silos, processing facilities, smoke sacks, warehouses, and industrial areas. In some areas where the roads were not adequately mapped, we had to also put them on the map so that it would aid us in our analysis. Next slide, please. Prior to our analysis, um, we also gathered some audio data from the field. And so after the data collection, we had to set a day aside to transcribe these audio data. In the course of transcribing, we were privileged to have Rosemary King and Dr. Goldsmith calling in to find some preliminary results. And we were also privileged to have Kubo, once it gave us a descriptive result, we were able to present to them what we found from this uh, field. Next slide. Hello, everyone. I'm Faustina, and I'll take us through um, the results of our interactions with these processes and feed mixers and poultry farmers. So the infograph you see is to give you a visual impression of the facilities that the team visited throughout the course of the study. So we had um, eight processing facilities, two feed mixers, and then two poultry farms. Next slide, please. Um, we also tried to look at the exact outputs of these processes. And we realized that two processing facilities were exclusive producers of soy grains. And this was Eradia Quine Soy Company Limited producing domestic milk and 3K and A Company Limited producing domestic oil. Now, prior to the study, we realized that already the Soybean Innovations Lab has already made a lot of inroads in the north with regards to incorporating um, soybeans into the diets of many people in the north. And so it was interesting to note that already down in the middle belt, um, soy, soy milk was a part of the diet of people as well as domestic oil, particularly for um, school growing children. The other six facilities actually process soy grains into industrial oil that they sold to people in the paint industry and then soy cake that they sold to people in the feed mixing industry. Next slide, please. So a major variable of interest was the source of raw soy. Upon interactions with processors, the team realized that predominantly the supply of soy grain comes from the three northern regions in Ghana. And so the map to the right on the slide shows the map of Ghana with the three northern regions highlighted in green. So this is predominantly where soy grains comes from for these processes. It was however interesting to notice that these processes do not actually travel to these regions to get the soy grains themselves. The reason for this was simple. Farmers in the north are smallholder farmers. And so they usually have very small parcels of land getting very small quantities of soy grain. As such, these aggregators have to go, aggregators who have long standing relation with these farmers actually have to go around to the farms and collect um, soy grains and then sell to processors. However, processors ex expressed concern that the bags of soy grain were often filled with stone, stick, and sand. They actually saw this as a measure or way by which farmers and aggregators actually teach them to be able to make more profit. Next slide, please. The team also tried to find out the price of local soy. And it was interesting to note that while the standard weight was 100 kilo, kilo bags, or kilograms, sorry, no two prices were ever the same. This was because of two reasons, the relationship with aggregators, the relationship processes had with aggregators and the cost of transportation. Now, as these processes have people that collect these grains for them, they're able to bargain on the price. And so at any point in time, the price of soybean would never be the same. Again, the cost of transport often increased or decreased the price of soybeans. This is because in rainy seasons, when the roads were often dilapidated and very bad, the cost of transport per bag of soybean was very high. As these uh, processes actually employ the use of haulage firms, so this comes as an added cost while getting um, soy grains. Again, when the roads, when the um, when we're in the dry season, the roads are relatively better, and so the price would go down. However, generally the price ranged from about 130 CDs, that is about 26.9 US dollars, to 300 CDs. Next slide, please. Given the scale at which um, soybean is known for soybean 
processing is known in Ghana. We the team thought it wise to find out about the storage facilities that these processes had. And it was interesting to note that two out of the eight processes had exclusive storage facilities for soybeans. These facilities, these processes being um, Eradia Quine Soy Company Limited and 3KNA Company Limited. The other six processes actually processed other grains as such their, their storehouses was not for soy grains alone. When we talk about the capacity of storage, we realize that it ranges from between 55 tons to about 75,000 tons. So 55 tons going to Eradia Quine Soy Company Limited and 75,000 tons going for AgriCare, CropCare, sorry. With regards to production, proportion of soy grain, it was about 25% of storage space. This actually supports the assertion that these processes actually don't produce only soy grains, but produce other grains like maize, um, granites. As, as such, only 25% of their storage was for soy grains. A major concern for these processes was the fact that they, there was always annual shortage with regards to the supply of soy grains for their production. Next slide, please. As such, it was interesting to find out exactly how these processes are able to get soy grains to support their production throughout the year. It was interesting to note that no processor actually imports soy grains. The reason for this was simple. Given the high exchange rates and the scale at which these processes produce, it was almost impossible for them to import soy grains by themselves. As such, these processes depend on private agro-importers who import processed soybean meal from Argentina, Brazil, and the United States. So the image to the right shows the team inspecting bags of imported soybean meal from Argentina. Processes express no particular difference in quality between locally produced soybean meal and imported soybean meal. However, they prefer the solvent extraction method to the mechanized method, mainly because the more de-oiled the oil is, the more de-oiled the cake is, the better the quality of feed produced. Next slide, please. Again, the team sought to find out the concerns of processes, some of the challenges that plagued them in the discharge of their daily processing activities. And the team realized that transportation was a major concern. So if you take a look to the map on the right, it shows the industrial area of Kumasi that is highlighted or colored in brown with processing facilities, feed mixers, and poultry farms in green, blue, and red, respectively. As is observed, almost all of the processing facilities and feed mixers and poultry farms are located out of this out of the designated industrial area. As such, this translated to bad roads that affected or increased the cost of transport with regards to cutting their soybeans to their plants, and also translated into high maintenance costs for their vehicles when it comes to supplying their products to their customers. Again, processes expressed a lot of challenge in assessing credit. They explained that they explained that Agriculture is seen as a very high risky venture here in Ghana and as such banks or credit facilities were very reluctant in giving them credit to support their business. There was also issues of interrupted power supply. Again, looking back at the map, these processing facilities and farms are in very remote locations, often in residential areas. As such, they have to process or work with um, power location that is allocated for residential settlements. As such, most of these processes were mostly unable to run all their plants at the same time to produce at full capacity, and this really hindered their business. Next slide, please. Hi, I'm Daniel, and I'll be taking us through some of the field challenges we had to face during the field data collection. So uh, since the team didn't want to commit to research ethics, we sent letters which we had from the university to these processes with the help of their colleague relief services, indicating our objective uh, for visiting their site. So these letters also had specific times and days 
that we will visit their processing site. Even though this was done, we had issues with non-compliance of some of these participants that we engaged in the study, which translates to some of them denying the team entry into their premises. So we made it to the premise, but we were denied entry into the premise. Therefore, we couldn't achieve the objective that we went there to do. We also had issues with some of them hesitating to offer responses to some of our questions that we asked. So even though we went, they, we were allowed into their premise, they felt reluctant in producing answers pertaining to their yearly output to the team. Also, we had issues with some of them not allowing us the opportunity to tour their site, their facility. So even though we were allowed into their premise, they responded to our questions. They didn't allow us the chance to tour the facility, which therefore we couldn't make use of our observation checklist. There were also difficulties we had in assessing some of these facilities. The reason being that most of these facilities are located outside the industrial area, uh, as it was depicted in the map we saw in the previous slide. So we can find most of these facilities at the outskirts of the city and also within the industrial area. So therefore, distances between these industries are quite lengthy, making traveling distance a bit longer. Also, roads leading to most of these facilities were on tarred, which were either dusty or muddy, as we can see in the image on our right. Also, we had issues with weather condition where the team actually had to pass through rain to visit some of these processing sites. And also, it further led uh, to us postponing the other visits to the next day, which affected the number of days that we used in the field data collection. Amid all these challenges, we were able to pull through and attain a successful project with the constant encouragement from our team leader, Mr. James Eshen. With all this said and done, I think we'll end here and thank you for your audience. This is UCC Youth Mappers. Thank you so much, Youth Mappers team. That was an excellent presentation. We'll now watch a short clip from a video that was produced showcasing the great work undertaken by the UCC Youth Mappers team. This clip features Kwame Odame, a PhD student at UCC and a Youth Mappers team member. In the video clip, clip Kwame speaks about the Kobo Toolbox software that the UCC Youth Mappers team used in their data collection. I was very fascinated to realize they offered basic simple statistics and even gave us the platform to translate the data into other data processing application like the SPSS, for instance, and giving us a very good um, graphical display of the places we went. I feel this tool is a very important one which will um, modernize the data collection process, especially for us students who have preference to cost timing and flexibility. It's, it's been a very great tool for the data collection. And as a reminder, a link to the full video is included in the helpful links document located in the handouts pane of your GoToWebinar control panel. We are now moving to the final two presentations of our webinar, but before we do so, let's go ahead and launch our last poll. You should see the poll on your screens now. We'll give you a few moments to record your answer. Okay, we'll go ahead and close the poll now. And let's launch the results. 
So you should see the poll results now. It looks like we have a very uh, engaged uh, audience with us today. So uh, yes, uh, the correct answer to the name of the free open source data collection tool is Kobo Toolbox. And you'll find a link to the Kobo Toolbox software in the helpful links document accessible in the handouts pane of your GoToWebinar control panel. In the handouts pane, you can also access the Youth Mappers team's final report and their webinar presentation today. And as a final reminder, please remember to write your questions in the questions pane of your GoToWebinar control panel. And we will address as many as we can at the end of the webinar today. I'd like to now give Dr. Peter Goldsmith, the director of the Soybean Innovation Lab, an opportunity to share with us his insights into how the findings of the Youth Mappers project have application for the Ghanaian soybean value chain. And let's see, Pete, uh, yep. Ed, yep, we're ready for you. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks so much. What a great presentation. Uh, tough to follow, tough to follow. Uh, but I wanted to, um, a lot was learned by uh, us at the Soybean Innovation Lab, the team at USAID, our partners uh, on the ground, uh, as well as um, uh, the youth mappers themselves. So I wanted to just share a couple of the, few of the learnings that I think are really important about uh, what's gone on here uh, in this project. Next slide, please. So uh, I'm gonna cover four kind of levels of learnings. Um, one to the UCC students themselves, uh, learnings by USAID, uh, the youth mappers as students, and then uh, the lab. And it's uh, first with the, and I'll provide some more details uh, later, but the UCC students, what, what the project did and the design of the project um, by uh, James and his team uh, was that mapping in your classroom is easy, uh, but mapping for impact, really engaging in development outcomes and impact, that's what this is about and what they achieved. For USAID, I'll talk about really how to in, uh, effectively engage a youth in development, not just as kind of part of a project, but as part of how development and smart development take place in the burgeoning knowledge economy. And then uh, the third area, the, the mappers themselves, they were uh, unfamiliar with the soybean value chain um, and, and they, the experience about industrial clustering, about location really matters. And soy just served as a, as a case study for them. So they really saw that theory and practice. And then for us at the lab and our partners at CRS, we've, we have a um, fair bit of research underway and this work really helped us better understand soybean markets in, in Ghana. Next slide, please. So first for the um, Cape Coast, <coughs> excuse me, students, the, there was a basic research question about why the production processing and utilization were so spread out in the country. Does it make sense? It, it seemed kind of counterintuitive to the students um, uh, as they began. And to answer the question, they needed to do a lot of real work. It wasn't just about mapping. They had to structure their research question in testable hypotheses about price and distance and space. They had to triangulate, looking at different uh, uh, sources of information to address the same question, to make sure that it wasn't just anecdote or opinion, but primary and secondary data supported the conclusion. And the, the best part was they had to get their hands dirty. They had to leave their computers, talk to managers, understand the language of managers and logistics and, and, and distribution and processing. They had to be prepared. This is a large project. It wasn't just heading out the door one day and visiting uh, processing firms. They had to be prepared to be on time, organized, and they had to prep themselves, know the language, walk the walk before they 
engage managers. So I'd urge you to read the report. It is very, very detailed, very rich. And uh, University of Cape Coast should really be commended for an amazing educational experience. I would think few students, um, not only in Ghana, but all over the world, few students really get the benefit of. This was a great learning experience. And, and us at the lab, we're, we do um, our uh, managed research area eight does a lot of research on the economics of the soy value chain. We currently, Dr. Marty, an economist with SIL and an economist at the Savannah Ag Research Institute is studying uh, price behavior, price efficiency and the fairness of soybean prices in Ghana. This is always of great concern to um, the industry and farmers to know that prices are, are fair and efficient. And Dr. Marty was able to leverage uh, in his work um, the, 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 the work by Youth Mappers. Youth Mappers was able to confirm that price in Ghana is driven in part by Kumasi as a buy center, um, so on the buy side. And that Tamale, uh, consistent with what the Youth Mappers were reporting, also dramatically affects price because it is the supply base for the country. And then as in the report, the youth mappers spend a fair bit of time talking about processors buying from importers because they have to operate their uh, plants uh, every day of the year and soybean supply might not be available. Every day domestic soybean may not be available. And so international markets play a big role in Ghana as well. So youth mappers really helped the uh, economics team at SIL uh, re, uh, understand better why price um, behaves the way it does. So thanks so much, Youth Mappers. Uh, and then the, the Youth Mappers themselves, they certainly knew about um, uh, mapping and, and uh, geospatial relationships uh, between assets or locations um, in a country or in a city or in an industry. And um, the, um, but they also realized by engaging with the, the, the managers that industrial firms buy lots of inputs. So it may not just be about one input, soy. They're buying other things they have to think about. And each one of these confirmed why being in the industrial cluster of Kumasi in the, in the central region made sense for accessing fuel, uh, labor, parts, um, also working with other industrial firms to argue for fair taxes, uh, good smart regulation and, and good policy. So it, the, the students got a well-rounded view of, uh, uh, of really what clustering is about. And so being close to markets, the poultry and the feed industry makes sense. And finally, uh, USA. Uh, USAID, um, recognizes the criticality of youth engagement for successful development. Uh, youth and, and engagement important for job creation, rural economic development, slowing out migration. Also very important that rural economies develop to promote national food security. And Youth Mappers reflects this smart development, training the workforce for the knowledge economy. There's excellent gender balance, uh, uh, which is admirable and really important. Local production of new knowledge. This was Ghanaians producing new knowledge for Ghanaian industry. And then there, of course, are numerous multipliers. This is a skill, a 21st century skill that's important for private sector mapping. Uh, drone demand is exploding. And also the whole area of precision agriculture requires the skills the youth mappers are developing. So it's um, a, a very, very important area. So lots of learnings from this exercise, not just by the students, but lots of us. And again, we commend James and University for Cape Coast and the Youth Mappers uh, Network uh, for uh, bringing, just creating a wonderful learning experience for everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for your insights, Dr. Goldsmith.
Our final presentation today will come from USA geographer Chad Blevins and USA data steward Anna Brennis. Chad and Anna will talk about youth mappers activities around the globe. Chad and Anna, please go ahead. Hello, everybody. This is Anna Brennis from the Bureau for Food Security. And uh, in my slide here, I asked the question, why did the Bureau for Food Security uh, choose to work with youth members? Why work with youth members? Um, and I think it's uh, strong evidence just by this uh, webinar that the youth members presented today, along with Dr. Goldsmith's presentations and findings, that they're, that answers the question. Uh, youth mappers are tech savvy. Um, we can build on their technical mapping skills, increase their knowledge of the soybean production and processing, and it also provided a snapshot for the Bureau for Food Security and the Soybean Innovation Lab of the soybean value chain and processing in Ghana. Uh, youth are curious and open-minded. Um, what we saw firsthand during this activity was how the peer-to-peer -peer knowledge sharing enabled all participants to gain a better understanding of the soybean value chain and processing and production in Ghana um, and the issues around that. Um, as agricultural development practitioners, we're always looking for ways to provide capacity building opportunities um, for youth. And their willingness, youth's willingness and ability to interact with their communities um, and the knowledge base that they bring about the cultural sensitivities, languages and customs of their countries um, provides a real opportunity for agricultural development practitioners to collect data, at the same time increase the outlooks um, and overall knowledge of youth and youth mappers. Um, it provides opportunities to engage in agricultural through technology, which can help change the perception of many youth that agriculture is not profitable. Um, and again, capturing data in the field where gaps exist and data collection is challenging, as easily facilitated with youth mappers, their amazing willingness and ability, um, their technical savvy, all of these traits make it uh, just one of the best uh, opportunities that I think we have in development work um, to capture agricultural data and build skills in youth and create opportunities for youth. And I'd like to thank the Soybean Innovation Lab and the youth mappers and the Geo Center for their strong collaboration and great work. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Anna. Hi, everyone. This is Chad Blevins with the USA Geo Center. And I just want to give a little bit more context on the Youth Mappers program and some of the projects and engagement that we have with these students around the world. There are currently almost 150 chapters in coming on 50 countries. And <clears throat> we have engaged students from a number of these chapters individually through annual events that we hold going back to the leadership workshop in 2017. This was the first time that I met in person some of the University of Cape Coast students who participated in this particular field study and led some of the uh, activities that were taking place. Uh, there was a small group of students, about 20, that were selected from a globally to come to Nepal. And that's where we introduced some of the tools like Kobo Toolbox and OpenStreetMap. And we learned, not only did the students learn from us, but we learned from them as well. Uh, in 2018, we brought a group of Youth Mapper students to Washington, DC for the research fellowship where each student was proposing a particular research topic to us in creating open geographic data to support the research in the countries of where they were from. Next slide, please. In addition to some of these projects that Youth Mappers initiates, there's also programs where local, local Youth Mappers themselves will initiate a project, such as the urban waste cleanup in Ikuria, Nigeria. One of our research fellows, Tim Adayo Isaiah, uh, after participating in the workshop, went back to Nigeria and took a self-asserted approach to help try and identify ways to eliminate the informal trash site dumping spots in Akure. So he engaged his 
Youth Mappers chapter at his university. The students went all around Akure, took a GPS coordinate of every illegal dumping site along with a picture, brought that data back into their GIS software, did some analysis and suggested ideas for the local town government to collect the garbage and carry it off site to concentrated locations, getting the trash out of the city. And this is just one of many local youth mappers projects that students have taken on. Oop. In addition to working with the Feed the Future team on agricultural food security, uh, there were two other case studies I just wanted to quickly mention. Uh, if you're listening to this webinar and you're interested in what you're hearing, uh, these are just other examples and ways to get engaged. You can email info at youthmappers.org to get connected with a chapter that's in the country of where you're working. In Rwanda, we worked with the President's Malaria Initiative team here at USAID on their indoor residual spraying project. It's a malaria prevention method where homes are sprayed with an insecticide to kill malaria carrying mosquitoes. We mapped all of the areas that were going to be sprayed in OpenStreetMap. That data was then brought onto tablets and it was used in the field to monitor which homes had been sprayed, which homes hadn't. And when the teams had to come back through on mop-up activities, they could quickly identify the places where there were gaps in spraying. Also, we worked with USAID's Global Health Bureau in Uganda on the Saving Mothers Giving Life Accessibility Analysis. And this was an area in rural Uganda where there was question of how close populations were to maternal health clinics where women could go to give birth to babies or for prenatal care um, and to take their children after they were born. And so we we mapped out the entire road network in three districts of Uganda going down to rural dirt tracks. And this data was used in an analysis using Access Mod 5, which is an uh, accessibility analysis open source software tool to identify where gaps were in some of these clinics throughout these three districts in Uganda. Great. Thank, thank you. Great. Yep, thank you so much, Chad and Anna, for your presentations. That was really wonderful to see the youth mappers reach globally. And Chad, great to see examples of um, youth mappers engagement um, in different sectors other than agriculture. So thanks so much. Um, we're now going to address some of the questions uh, raised by attendees today. Uh, Dr. Goldsmith will moderate this session and will direct questions to the panelists of the webinar. Uh, just a gentle reminder to the panelists to please keep your responses as brief as possible so we can get to as many questions as we can. So Dr. Goldsmith, please go ahead with the questions. Yeah, uh, thank you, Courtney. Uh, some great questions in. We have, uh, I see about seven minutes, so we won't get to all of them, but uh, we'll uh, uh, definitely some, some great questions. We'll go back to you uh, if we don't get, it, get time uh, during this uh, Q&A. Um, we had um, uh, a great question from uh, 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 Victor Sunday from Nigeria, who was asking the youth mappers about Kobo. And so what would you tell someone about your experience? Is it a good experience? Were there any challenges with Kobo? Um, what kind of guidance would you give them? So, uh, Bo and team, I think this, oh, yep, go ahead. Hello. Hello. Yep, we can hear you. Please go ahead. This is Pami. Um, I think the Cobo Toolbox app is a one-stop shop data collection instrument compared to the conventional paper approach. One, smartphones are all over the place. You don't need to go out with printed um, sheet. And you have an app that could collect all sorts of data that can allow you to um, develop all sorts of questions with flexibility and the power of the internet. So if, if you want convenience, if you want to work smarter and not harder, 
I think the Kobo toolbox is one of such means you can employ. After all, I think one of its greatest advantages is the um, um, simple descriptive statistics it offers for you to offer preliminary results and look at the data you have collected from the field without um, hustling or struggling to um, go through another data entry process. So if you really want to collect data in a more faster approach, I think you should rather resort to Kobo. It's the student's best friend. Excellent, excellent. Uh, great question, great answer. Our next question comes uh, from Duncan Soames uh, from uh, Kenya. And Duncan is asking this question to Anna and Chad, and if Carrie is still on, that would be great, the USA team, about lessons you've learned about mobilizing students uh, to engage in development. Uh, to and students as data collectors to provide uh, to uh, development organizations as well as the private sector. What are your thoughts? Hi, this is Chad. I can chime in real quick. Um, I think the students of the world are really an untapped resource and something that USAID is trying to engage more and more in their work. It seems like there's more initiatives that are asking for youth to be integrated into development projects and programs throughout the world. I currently serve as the <clears throat> youth point of contact for the Global Development Lab, and I work on the youth power team here at USAID or with the youth power our team, um, and they're always looking for ways to further engage youth. And I think that, as these students mentioned, you know, going out on surveys on bumpy, dirty, dusty roads uh, for a long time in the in heat and poor conditions, you know, students were smiling the whole time. And the pictures that I saw on social media they were posting, they were smiling from ear to ear and very happy to get out and do some of this work that. Uh, uh, you know, other people might not be as uh, energized and happy to do. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Chad. Um, we have a question from Kathy Allison from the U.S. who is asking, wants to ask the students about next steps. Uh, you've done soy processing. Chad's mentioned some other projects within the Youth Mapper Network. For you guys as Youth Mappers at UCC, what are your next steps? Okay. Hello. Can you Hi, Kwame. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, after the so, um, soya bean project, we have um, another project in the northern Ghana, particularly looking at mapping um, farm um, farm um, lands, particularly for um, maize and um, maize production. The purpose of this is to one help farmers know the exact boundaries of their lands and put them on the map and also help farmers to properly have a predictive power over the outputs of their crop at the end of the year. So we are working in collaboration with some scientists who will be in position to help us. Given the mapping project estimates the farmers yield so that they will be able to also estimate how much money they can come out at the end of the farming period and also plan for their lives. So this is one next project we are actually aiming to undertake this particular month. And hopefully um, when it's done, we will equally convene a program like this and also share our experiences on you. So we want to make sure we engage our great sector, put them on the map, and also increase spatial analysis and help them plan how to reach every other person within the agriculture sector. So that's our next project for the um, UCC Youth Mapa chapter in Cape Coast. That's great. Thank you, Kwame. Uh, Dr. Goldsmith, we have time for one more question. One, one last question comes from uh, uh, Francisca Ade from Mapoa in, in northern Ghana. Uh, Francisca is asking, this is kind of a technical question to the team about uh, protein and oil. Did the processors talk at all about different varieties and the, the amount of protein and oil in the soybean that they buy. Uh, was that a, a, a topic of conversation when you were interviewing them? No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't, unfortunately. Good, that's okay, that's okay. Just that was her question. Maybe we have a, a quick one then. Uh, also uh, on the technical side, uh, Mona McCord 
uh, from the Grameen Foundation was asking about, do the processors uh, buy from importers as well as buying from uh, domestic soybean? As indicated, none of the processors cited importing the soya bean directly from any of the countries, Argentina, Brazil, the reason being that one, um, the current exchange rates did not permit them. It would have been very costly. And the second reason is that these processors did not form a cooperative and hence did not have the bargaining power to do that on their own. Hence, they were rather relying on agro process, agro importers who were buying rather in bulk quantities and supplying to these people in retail sizes. So none of them did import, but they did buy from agro importers. Thank you very much. Excellent, excellent answer. I'll turn it back over to Courtney to wrap up. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Goldsmith, for moderating the Q&A session, and thank you to the panelists for your excellent feedback. This concludes the Youth Mappers Navigating the Ghanaian Soy Value Chain webinar. Thank you all for your attention and interest today. If we did not get a chance to address your question, we will be communicating with you after the webinar concludes to provide a written response. This webinar has been recorded and a link to the recording will be sent to you in a follow-up email, as well as a link to the Youth Mapper's materials and all of the presentation slides from today. Thank you again for your interest and goodbye.